Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center, CUNY in Midtown, in Manhattan. Another day on planet Earth. Uh, yesterday we heard from Carol Martin, and I thought a quite uh, a detailed and inspiring and uh, with deep knowledge about the theater of the real, her observations um, on the co current state um, of the theater, what is she is following, and uh, and I thought it was uh, quite an important uh, an update. We had Yiddish theater. Um, on, uh, on, on, on Wednesday, we heard from India last year from the Ruhr Festspiele, from the Theater der Welt, and, um, and in our journey around the world. Today, we go to the UK, and we haven't been there um, too often. I feel we hear many voices anyway from the uh, British stage in America. If there's any country that is close, the UK um, as it disintegrates, right? Yeah, it disintegrates. UK. It is. Uh, it is the UK. I think people know more about British theater than about Canadian theater, um, and uh, vice versa. So, um, with us today is a pioneer. Um, I think of um, the theater we care about, the theater we know. And um, it is the uh, great uh, David uh, Goddard. David, go, where are you now and uh, what time is it? And go a little bit backwards maybe so we see your face uh, uh, in the camera. Yeah, where are you? It's, it's five o'clock, Frank. Um, a very dull late afternoon. We've had about one and a half day, days of sunshine. Um, I'm in... Uh, a flat which is tall and where I um, handled lockdown very painfully. In London, right? In London, on the banks of the Thames. Uh, I'm surrounded by London uh, mementos, if you like. In this very flat, the first lesbian novel was written by and called The Well of Loneliness. Uh, and I had neighbors like, or no, I didn't have neighbors, the flat had neighbors like Sir Oswald Mosley, the wartime leader of the fascists, who was arrested on this stairway, um, and General de Gaulle uh, uh, fought for the free French from this building. Incredible, incredible. That means in the flat you were in, people went through World War I, World War II, the resistance, the Spanish plague, and now you are there um, in Corona. For people who do not know about David, and, um, and I apologize that we cut his uh, bio so much, David is uh, a very influential, important figure in the global international avant-garde. He was and is a pioneering artistic director, theater maker and producer whose influence has spent multiple generations from around the globe. He is most known for his work at the Great Riverside Studios in London at the time when Beckett, when Cantor, when Giacometti, uh, Tarkovsky, everybody who was anyone in the scene would come and go uh, through the Riverside Studio. People, he was close to the people from the Berliner Ensemble, has, has deep ties to the Eastern European theater and also to Arab theater. Um, it's way too much uh, to, to, to go through here. He teaches student directors at the National Film School and the Burbeck University of London. He was for a short time at the Montclair State uh, University, but more importantly, um, he is at the uh, International Writers Program at the University of Iowa with the Playwrights Workshop. It's a very important program, one of the great, maybe the most respected writing program actually um, in the nation. And uh, David in 2019 was invited even to Buckingham Palace, if I understood right, to get a, an award for his service to Britain, the kingdom, uh, the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth. So David, um, still go a little bit ahead. You're back, we see uh, mostly, uh, we don't see your face so much. So tell us a little bit, uh, how are you feeling in these days? How are you experiencing, how are you experiencing the time of Corona? How are things in London? Uh, well, I'm not sure they're the same thing, but I think they're the same thing. Meaning as I suspected, getting over the pandemic or going to the next stage is more painful than uh, when one was trying to kind of handle it really, because one's frustration and anger at a wasted year can come out. And much of the year for, for everybody really was to do with confused signals. And so somehow we, we, we were very obedient but 
we in a funny way knew not to trust anybody. And uh, everybody was blaming everybody else. Politicians blamed the scientists. The scientists were on an alert. Now there's some kind of promise of a golden dawn, but as it's still pouring with rain, and as there's a threat that if we don't behave ourselves, we could have another one, we could have another lockdown. Um, we're sort of nervous, really. Yeah, just today I saw that numbers are already uh, rising again uh, in, in the UK uh, of infections and death. Yes, because of the, not because of the, but because of the, you know, the Indian variant um, popping up here and what have you. But, what about theaters? Are they open? Are they closed? Have you gone to theater? They're beginning to open just. But it, it's a picture. I find it quite difficult to discuss this specific point because when we talk about theaters, it's with like the American concept of theaters, which is we're talking about a, a commercial world. And despite Andrew Lloyd Webber and Cameron McIntosh playing a prominent part, in uh, the publicity for theater, which is always appreciated. And uh, uh, in a funny way, none of them really represent the theater that I've always known and had to fight for. Um, like I, I began at the Royal Court Theater, which was founded by George Devine after the last great crisis, which is the Second World War. And he had a policy which was the, the right to fail. Well, of course, we don't have any language like that nowadays. What we have is somehow we're going to sell, 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 and the economy is going to boom again. And that has no meaning to me. It is not part of my past. I am used to full houses and people loving Tarkovsky or Dario Fo or good British theatre. But that's because in a way, they decide they too want intelligent work. But once you start talking about what the revival seems to be about, which is Mamma Mia through to Phantom of the Opera, it's not that that is a different world, but, uh, it's to do with tourism and entertainment. And one's actually spent the whole of one's life slightly trying to articulate theater to the side of that. And above all, of course, including great figures like Bertolt Brecht, um, who are the figures who really should indicate the future. Because if one of the things that's gone wrong with the pandemic here is the political dishonesty sort of caught up with America, if you'll forgive me putting it that way. Mm. But just as you seem to be handling it with your um, uh, presidential issue, um, we've gone into handling it even though we don't believe our major political statements. Um, and that what you're left with is what we've always cared about, which is that theater should be about the truth and that play should be about real issues. And um, we will have to go back to that somehow. And in the middle of it, you've always had pioneers from abroad, if you like, like Cantor, right? Who in their curious way fought and fought and fought and were practical and showed the way. So we're going to have to have that again, but we don't know what it means until it happens. But the, the great Royal Court Brechtian revolution with new writing being about things that matter will now have to re-energize itself and there's every indication it will. Mm -hmm. And of course on certain fronts like Black Lives Matter, Right, it's doing rather well with leaders and directors here like Kwame from Baltimore when he was your side, right? Um, launching the Young Vic here, you know, very heavily on a black policy. That 
looks well for funding, for the public, and for talent. Mm. But there are, there's a confusion there. And there always has been in theatre, and which, which is that entertainment and theatre are sort of parallel. Mm. Is how I would put it for the time being. Mm -hmm. And mm. when I was in a funding to locate Cantor in London after a run at the Edinburgh Festival, I just had to believe that people wanted to see what I wanted to see, and they did, um, which is a sort of philosophy for theatre, really, which is you can't have too much a, a theory. You've got to have a belief in special individuals who somehow will make the point and people will come and the theatre will function. The other thing, which is a uh, boom time uh, for Phantom of the Opera, even though the great Hal Prince, and I mean it, has been educated by Piscator, right, is the kind of confusion that this thing called the media, which I don't, I don't quite know whether you've changed at all, but media here now is a different phenomenon. Almost nothing can happen without its permission. And that's why, for example, our greatest playwright, playwright Edward Bond, barely exists. And Edward Bond will be, and he's still alive, mm -hmm. and hale and hearty. And he will probably be the first playwright to really write about this period. But nobody ever mentions him because that's not entertainment. Mm -hmm. Well, Carol Churchill is not entertainment. Sorry? Carol Churchill is not entertainment either. That is true, but Carol Churchill will stay in there because she will continue to rethink and have new ideas. But that curious kind of Brechtian way of challenging with theater, I find it very interesting because almost everything we talk about is to do with theater space and how you move from one space or you conjure up a space, whether it's back to the Greeks or back to the, to the globe theater. And this has been the period of confinement in space. It's made for dramatic changes in thinking about performance, you know, how you escape space. Do you go out of one space into another, or do you go from one dungeon into another? We have a language which is uh, for being safe or for, uh, or for escaping, or for well, we have all these facilities in language. But actually, over uh, quarantine or pandemic, we don't have that language. We have pretend language, and that's what the politicians are playing with, which is, don't worry, guys, on the 21st, we're going to actually walk through a door and you're going to be able to sit inside the pub, right? And England will be Churchillian again. Because the great thing about modern English history is that after the war, when the English were meant to vote for Churchill, they didn't. Yeah, yeah, you, you lost the election. So what do you think about theater your riverside studio was such an exceptional place and i have never heard of such an array of artists ever in any place um, of a time coming together working there um, and um and we are looking now you know how should a theater function what works what doesn't it has to be different corona but things did work and there were models and i think the riverside studio was one tell us a little bit how did it become what it was, how did it start? What did the Riverside Studio by get chance. right? What did by they chance. get right? Yeah, tell us, tell us. If you're foreign, it's by chance. Yeah. In those days, you didn't do foreign work. If you wanted to do foreign work, and if you wanted to be English and be foreign, you went to the Mickery in Amsterdam, which in the 70s was a kind of uh, showplace, really, for the best of international European theatre. 
uh, and the rest of us you know, travel to Berlin to see the Schaubühne or what have you. But what I would say is the great, you, you, you know, this curious word theory, which I think partly um, has never properly discussed between campus and theater itself, uh, which is the great emphasis in theater should be on the practical. And one of the things that I think is still understated about a great man like Tadeusz Kantor is not his theory, and I'm not sure what that is, but in any case, it would be in the language of the history of art rather than the history of theater, except like the best people, he admired a great British artist called Edward Gordon Craig, mm -hmm. who the English never discuss or talk about. Over this side, he was the colleague of Yeats at the Abbey mm -hmm. Theatre, where I've also been the associate director. But my point about Cantor is, is that he was so busy gaining his achievements in art through freedom in a corrupt dictator's society that we don't have the language for it because we assume that we didn't have to do that. And I suspect that as the future unfolds, we're going to have to fight for that kind of what I call practicality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's called, how did Cantor get 20 artists uh, regularly traveling to Ellen Stewart in New York and taking New York by storm at La Mama? Well, the answer is partly by having the full support of Ellen Stewart. But it was about a day-by-day -day struggle for getting papers. Mm -hmm. Right, we're back to that in England now. If I want to go to Italy for a theater meeting uh, in, a, in a month's time, the first thing I've got to do is pay for a visa. And that's never happened in my life. Yeah, my so point terrible. being, the opening up of all of that will come with the energy and the wherewithal of doing the hard work and the paperwork. Mm -hmm. But paint us a little picture about the Riverside Studio. Was it in the center of London at the side? How did it look like? How did it, key how thing did it about come into being? Be the key thing about Riverside Studios is that it was given public money on condition that, it, that we didn't just practice theatre, which at the beginning meant with Peter Gill, who was uh, quite early a much respected is still a much respected English director and who launched the building uh, uh, one year after the dead class. Uh, and it was a film studio, right? At the banks of uh, it like was the old Doctor Who studios and it was the film studios of Jack Buchanan. Mm -hmm. So you must imagine a world which belonged both to. Uh, film and theater. So Jack Buchanan uh, would c come out of the West End Theater um, at 10.30 or whatever, uh, get his car down to Riverside Studios and film for the rest of the night. And the history, the history, the intertwining where one seems to be lodging something modern is very, very rooted in the historical, uh, which is why I was pleased to throw in a reference to Michel Saint-Denis earlier. Mm -hmm. Or, um, for example, I've just done a board meeting to reopen the Motley Design course, you know, who designed more productions on Broadway than any designer. Right, well, we still have the design course and where funding will now come because there is a deep need for black uh, design training. And the money therefore will come because, and I'm not saying this cynically, black lives matter and suddenly the money is available. 
Mm. Um, but nobody was quite prepared for me to say at the beginning, look, sorry, guys, I know I talk a slightly different language, but you do realize that the longest run of Shakespeare on Broadway was designed by Motley and starred Paul Robeson mm. as Othello. So the, the intertwining of our history through these pandemics, wars which are worse than what we've experienced in the last year. Um, and, uh, but it's me taking theory into what I call hard work and practicality. Mm -hmm. Rather like a film, like a rather like a tell, you know, that, that if you are Tarkovsky, your real genius is not in your theory, but in that you're getting the film done and paid for and when paid for. it's not easily, so how did, easily recognized. How many people came? How many people fit in the Riverside studio? Why did you decide to have global work, the international artists, and did audiences did. come right away? They didn't. Come on, Frank. You, we've all got our equivalent experiences. Peter Gill had the talent to let us use the empty Doctor Who studios for a transfer from the Edinburgh Festival, which had taken the world by storm because of 20 minutes on the BBC of seeing the dead class. One week later, you've got Margot Fontaine and Rudolf Nureyev queuing outside to see it. Right, impossible to get a ticket. Okay, then you go to the next board meeting, which I won't have been at, but where I've heard, and you and the politicians will say, look, why are we spending money on this strange thing I've never heard of? Who are these strange Japanese people? And then the clever spokesman or director will say, well, I don't, I don't really know, but last month seemed to do okay. And it's a bit late now. We better, we better endorse the next one. And then month by month, you build up something that gets a response. And something rather strange happened at Riverside, really, which is that people came because of the, what the building represented, not because of the the specific art form and I said and, and so is the great partnership at Riverside for example was New York dance that Judson took over Riverside that Steve Paxton and Trisha Brown packed them in so you hit another aspect which is I wanted to see these people and happily through critics if you like the public did as well. But it, we were in danger of missing out on that generation in the 70s in New York before everybody started doing opera and big shows coming from the lofts of New York. And it was all, and because we shared social activities, meeting, bar, cafe, what have you, you know, it was rather nice to have a place where Trisha Brown met Samuel Beckett. How did Beckett come to the Riverside Studio? Why would he come to that small, old, falling apart building? Not in well, the primarily of because happened? there is the genius of a woman who designed Beckett's work and who was George Devine's partner at the Royal Court called Jocelyn Herbert, who was the designer of the, the, the Royal Court Golden Age. And Beckett loved her work and loved her as a fellow artist. And uh, when Beckett had problems, which I'm not sure I can say accurately or properly, over going home to Dub Dublin, the great writers of Dublin theatre, of Irish theatre, have this problem, which is they have a history of being banned by the Archbishop and God knows what else. Um, and uh, so... Having been, if you like, a little sentimental, but on the ball about what matters, Beckett responded to the San Quentin Company in the 60s when Rick Clucci, um, and by my time, 
using great American actors like Alan Mandel. Um, uh, and the uh, St. Quentin Company, let's just explain, it came out of the St. Quentin a prison in death San row. Francisco, in San Francisco, the death row, uh, yeah. you know, legendary place. And they wrote, he, they, Rick Clucci wrote to Beckett saying, can we have permission for doing Waiting for Godot in death row? And the 60s were so peculiar in one sense, that we may need them again, I've realized, that um, they started touring to other prisons. And then before we knew it, I actually saw it on the fringe in Edinburgh. So somehow it, it became a, a means of freedom and Beckett fell in love with having a godson who was the son of Rick called Samuel Clucci, right? So by the time we get to the 80s, and I'm artistic director of Riverside Studios, uh, uh, the Abbey and Rick are asking Beckett to work with them. And he says, fine. And then I have, then it all becomes a bit personal. He says, well, would you speak to, and that's, that's how we that's met, how although I, I'd been associated with him. At, you know, I know your letters are included. At the Royal Court, at the Royal Court. Yeah, 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 in the, in the, um, not in, a, not in a leadership way. And so there was this peculiar area where Beckett didn't like going home. There was a really important area, by home I mean to Ireland, except for funerals. There's a specific area um, where, and this still goes on if you're, watch, if you're reading your Times Literary Supplement at the moment, where there was, the, Beckett appreciated his professors and experts, but was sort of nervous of working in public, as it were, because people would just home on him. And I suppose I was sort of quite good at handling that, which is everybody belonging and being part of it. The building's geography suited it. And, um, and nobody got upset and they got, he was, and he started having such a good time that uh, to this day, I meet somebody in the street of London who says, oh, last time I saw you, I had a coffee with Samuel Beckett mm -hmm. because Beckett was having such a nice time directing. Of course, they were, he, you know, strangers were trying to say hello and all that kind of business. And so, so what my was, tip, if, I, if I may interrupt you, just one more thing. My tip is always only talk about two things, Guinness and cricket. And it worked. <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> that's that's a good tip. It works uh, with a Beckett, an Irish yeah. writer in exile. But um, Dave, tell he us loved a bit what worked. He loved directing. He loved directing. Yeah, he loved directing. What worked? How come the Riverside was a place for such great artists? They felt at home. How was the relationship to the audience? What audience came? Well, it depends on whether you're being political or not. Like it got caught after a decade, true to kind of radical precedent, uh, because they came from everywhere. And uh, your politicians do their survey of where your audience is coming from, and they're meant to come from what we would call the borough of Hammersmith, where the ratepayers are paying for the theatre. But hold on, only one third are coming from around here. The second third is coming from across the river. And the third, third third is coming from Hampstead. So you're hitting against that. If you really are popular and you become, then uh, it happens, it happens. But you've got to believe that, you've got to believe, for example, well, Let's say the most important thing I had to do with Beckett every morning was open the mail over coffee. And of course, what you discover 
is you've got one of the most democratic men in the world that you're handling. Because it's like Kafka or something, which is there are people all over the world, and certainly all over England, who could only get out of bed in the morning and wrote to him because they could exist it or because Kafka existed, or because Dostoyevsky, all these people that the middle brow or the middle class, whatever you want to it, thinks are elitist, are actually popular people, but they speak to individuals everywhere. Mm -hmm. And these people turn up. I don't want to romanticize it any, but that is how, so I'm writing to you because I'm a striking minor. I'm writing to you because I'm, I've had a nervous breakdown. I'm writing to you because I'm in prison. And then in between all of this, I would have Beckett alert to his colleagues in Poland or wherever it is, mm. so that they would get authorization for doing the plays and you know, carrying the, the letters and the envelopes and the food parcels sometimes. Mm. Now it's, it's all it, is, that. it is incredible. You also, um, you know, had, uh, um, so many artists, the Giacometti, Monigliani, you had Tchaikovsky working there, um, and um, and you had audiences. So, so something something was working. What was your vision at the well, time? First of and all, what was your vision? Why did you make the theater for whom and how is that relevant for today? You so said something has, say, is lost. Let's say one thing that you'll understand, Frank, which is they were invited. And the thing about wonderful people is that they're ignored too. So you I invited don't... them by mail, you wrote a letter. Somebody wanted them to come. I wrote to them, I said, will you come? And of course, if you want to be cynical about it, it meant that I wasn't paying the huge fees that, they, that Paris was paying. Um, but like when Dario Fo homed at Riverside, nobody else had invited Dario Fo to London, nor had since. So you've got a you've got somebody on your side. You've got somebody wanting to do the workshops, wanting to go into new territory and be supportive at the same time. Mm -hmm. But it is a curious thing. Don't forget the English have all. Well, it's now we know, according to the Times this week, that the BBC are in trouble because they didn't support Brexit. Right. If you were a foreign artist, you longed to be invited to London. Right. And nobody did it. So Dario Fo would have walked to London because somebody had invited him after all these years. And I, uh, so the, the kind of the London thing, and then this curious thing can happen, which you'll also get because you're a New Yorker, which is that if you had a success with the press in London, you then could go all over the world, which is what happened with Cantor. That a review in the Times at that time meant that you went straight to Tokyo. But we were not paying what, um, let's say, Paris with the, the backing of Pompidou. And I mean, I think I can remember Cantor specifically saying at one time, you know, there are two there you know, there are two people I'm sentimental about, two places I'm sentimental. And he knew how much we suffered, if you like. And he meant he said he knew Ellen Stewart was one, and I was the other. It meant that we wanted him. And we didn't have money. But we paid fees and we we got through there, and then it was fun to do. So the background is also tied to production values. Two things happened. One is we had, if you like, the production refugees from the Royal Court who all wanted to do new work. And because they'd been in the Royal Court Theatre, they were the best people in the country, right? And they would take a cut because it's the time when people were bored, right? And um, uh, I think it was the need for fresh air. And of course, politically, it was in trouble because it's the it's the beginning of that recession. It's Margaret Thatcher coming to a recession. So you go into a decade of being a football between political parties. Hmm. And you I'm talking about, about, yeah. talking about Dario Fo. We can be talking about anybody. 
Mm. Cantor, Cantor knew the game that had to be played. Mm. Um, you, you talked about a new, discover new territory or new world. What does it mean to you? How did you single it out? You, you had that uh, instinct. So many artists you supported became significant ones or were already significant, but you saw them. Um, in the time also right now we look what is important what is significant what did you learn how do you how did you do that well, maybe, what is maybe. important well i'm not oxbridge i am from i was educated in edinburgh i began as a trainee director at the travers which was it, which is in itself a fascinating example of anglo-american creativity when um a young graduate of the army gets one of those scholarships to study after the army and founds a paperback bookshop in Edinburgh that becomes the Travis Theatre. Um, and it was our first kind of experimental theatre, really, with you know visits from Andre Serban and the rest. So kind of La Mama in Scotland was rather interesting. Um, uh, sorry, go on. Ask my question. The question again. So, what the new? How, how, what is what is new work? New territory? How do you define it? What was your vision at the time? Say, this is what I want to bring. Well, I think I'm saying that if you come from the right background, like from, uh, if you have the good fortune to come from Sierra Leone, let's say. You're not looking with the prejudices that you have if you're coming from Oxford. So new work is actually freshly new work, if you get me. I'm not saying it as a patronizing thing. I say, and in a funny way, I think the visual arts world has been better at it than, and the dance world over this period was too, with Judson performance in New York. So that world represented or had lead, that had leadership with John Cage and Merce Cunningham and, and the others, on the whole was coming through into the visual arts and performance. It wasn't coming through to theater as such, but I had a real education at the Royal Court with directors like Lindsay Anderson and William Gaskell, and we knew that new work was new writing that had an edge that was about something that was really going on in the world. And this had its roots in what we're trying to talk about over the pandemic, which is George Levine and the middle-aged men coming back from the Second World War coincide, if you like, with the men who don't vote for Churchill, in that they say, we're not going back to the English system, the English class system. And they say, we're, we, want a, we want a theater that expresses that. Now, because they were the best actors in Hollywood and England, it meant that every time Edward Bond played to an empty house, they could ring up Noel Coward or uh, uh, Vivian Lee and say, will you come and do a quick show for us because we've gone broke? And so they played that game, but new work in a funny way has to be a new way of thinking of society. Um, and the visual arts for a period has been very good at it. The period that I'm coming out of, which is Cantor, Joseph Boyce, um, Buckminster Fuller was there right, kind of radical thinking. And in a funny way, they coincide with an education in the early 70s. In other words, I mean, I've just gone back to reading Marshall McLuhan, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Who was a literary professor, by the way, English language, right? He was in the or, started out. Yeah. You know, my neighbor in Edinburgh by chance was Chomsky because we were opening, they were, they were, I was only a student, they were opening a linguistics department. It was new territory. And one was clinging to a lot of that. And then by the time you get to the 70s, it's this recession time, 
uh, Margaret Thatcher and everything that's happened since in her relationship with Ronald Reagan, if you like. Mm. But new, new, new work at the end of the day, you have to, in a funny way, you, have, you need a major artist to give language to. And Cantor was one of those. And Beckett was one of those. And we all know that the point about Beckett is that he had to find language that allowed him to write again after he'd seen the Holocaust. That as a man who'd been part of the resistance, which again was what he was a bit angry with the neutral island about, mm. um, uh, uh, to be able to write, and writing in both languages helped him, French and English, but to be able to write such that you must go on, ironically expressing final scenes in Chekhov. We've got to work, Uncle Lanya. Um, and that's what we're in now. And that's why I believe in working at problems, whether it's for the young, for the unemployed, for the people who are not going to get training, for education here going completely up the creek with Zoom, forgive me. Mm -hmm. You know, the understate, one of the understated stories here at the moment is the is the uh, students who are, who, are, who are panicking with Zoom. Mm -hmm. How did you, at the Riverside Studio, how did you combine these ideas of, on one way, you brought over the Cirque um, Imaginaire, uh, kind of a very popular <laughs> Uh, and work also next. Yeah, they're great, but they are now. Uh, you were, they you are did now the god. They are now the god. The, uh, let me finish. You helped, the, you helped for the the black, uh, for the tap dance movement. You know, you brought over the, the tap dancers, but nobody wanted to see them. So how I, how well, important was this idea of popular theater to you, or idea? Victoria Chaplin and Jean Baptiste Thierry are the godparents of New Circus, and its repercussions yes. all over the world. And the fact that that switch into, switches into, uh, let's say, uh, incarceration across the river from me, where Charlie Chaplin's mother was in the mental hospital and he used to take her out to play in the park every day. And eventually she ends up, the, the grandmother, in a wheelchair overlooking the Pacific where her son has founded Hollywood, as it were. Yeah, and this is brilliant, brilliant daughter, Victoria, with her and their children, who um, focused really a whole new wave in in um, in circus. So, and that's terribly important because it's a bit like going to Buckingham Palace, you uh, refer to, which is suddenly everybody knows what you're talking about. They'll come to the show. They're coming to the show, right? Um, so, but you you mentioned uh, the tap, tap dancers that you did also. You presented who? the the tap dancers from New York when they were oh, when yeah. they were not oh. really presented even in, oh, okay. in this. Who I'm more proud of than anybody, and it's that I am in New York and I'm asked to meet a film student who's done his graduation film called. No maps on my taps, called um, Nuremberg and George. And he, uh, would I put on the, because we were a film facility too. Greenway did a lot of work at Riverside. Greenway, yeah, you knew him. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so I look at the film, and in my usual irresponsible way, in inverted commas, I say, okay, we'll launch the film and then we'll have an interval, right? And the real thing can come on, meaning these wonderful dancers in their 70s and 80s who no longer found work in Harlem or in New York because variety was dead and were doing community projects in Harlem. And so you have, you have these group of people trained by Bojangles Right, who uh, one of them also starred on Broadway called Honey Coles, who did My One and Only with Twiggy. But they were 
old men who thought it was never going to happen again. And suddenly, they were so classy, the world wanted them. And then you have another partnership, which is relevant to the time, which is the BBC started doing programs about them, making films about them, a new wave of good filmmaking at the BBC. And so the whole kind of woodwork, for want of a better word, of Harlem left in Europe with great people now doing Harlem workshops, but legends, you know, um, uh, uh, I, I mean, the last time I did a concert with one of them, the musical director was the avant-garde composer, Gavin Breyer. So one mixed them all up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it meant, you know, one night I've got Honey Coles on stage with a little jazz band, right? Um, packed with people and this little old lady joins him for the curtain call and he brings her to meet me afterwards and she's in her 80s right? and she's called Adelaide Hall. Now, David, you've got to realize this is jazz history. This woman invented scat. She's the woman who's uh, in the wings at the cotton, oh, as at the cotton club, he's recording something, and he hears this woman humming. He says, "Come here, come here!" And so they record the Creole love song together, right? And of course, since the thirties or whatever, she'd been in Paris and London as a refugee from racist New York, because not only did they have to handle the Cotton Club implications, and uh, they had to handle, for example, if they had to handle, not jazz singers, in, but it's like Elizabeth Welch, they had to handle Broadway, they were handling a segregated audience. And so they found kind of home in wartime Europe. Um, and we're still going mm. in the in the 80s and so we made documentaries with them and one of them was back singing with Derek Jarman in The Tempest and it goes on they 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 are they are gold dust the Harlem generation are gold dust mm -hmm. and they are as avant-garde as um anything Robert Wilson would want Mm, absolutely. Yeah. My, so this is incredible. So let's summarize a little bit. You said, you know, you have to discover new territory. You do new, new work. It has to be about truth, a social movement, kind of an imagination for a change of the society as it is, has to come first. It will be expressed by artists. You mixed up things as a curator. You invite great people, people who are not just not invited. You wrote the letter, but you also then put them together with others. You had interdisciplinary thing you had a film you showed women like, like bam does now but i know also you were close to architecture visual arts you also directed you did the hamlet which you did in eastern europe and went to the arab world yeah. and then also to japan what does art mean for you why did you dedicate your life to art and what does it mean now what 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 should we expect from it i think i'm i i represent without knowing it most of my life, uh, the, the majority of people maybe who grow up looking to the clouds and wondering what the journey is. And of course, we strongly feel that at the end of the pandemic, right? And somehow you keep going forward little by little, then eventually it makes sense. But you don't put on Tadeusz Kantor because he's going to change the art world. You put on Tadeusz Kantor because he asked me to. And I knew that if I didn't make that summer work, even with a relationship with the, the good Richard DeMarco, 30, 20 poles were going to have a ruined summer. 
that old thing of Eastern Europe, you know, that you were either going to give people a turn or they were going to have another miserable year. And so you did it. You know, it's like everything in any radical situation. It's not that you decide, but it's that you open the door and somebody says, help me, and you do it. And the arts relationship with you, I worked with Tarkovsky, I helped Tarkovsky, not because I was rich, but because I had the will to say, just give him the money for his last film. Um, and, you know, having been invited to do that. Uh, and it's something that the public as a whole would not under, would not know about. But nearly everybody of real significance in the history of the arts has a time when they are like a student, which is they say, how do I get my work done? You know, and if you like, in London, it's, I, I mean, having gone on this far, it's a pity to get this far really by saying, well, of course, there was always this shining example who's still alive happily in London called Peter Brook. You know, who, 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 who abandoned the Royal Shakespeare Company and commercial success, really, but was given money by France, which was one of the options in the world. Um, to do with their history. But, but on the whole, I went my way because it interested me. And by the way, that old thing, which is, okay, if you're going to fire me, I'd rather be back directing anyhow. You know? But it, I couldn't make it happen for 10 years. And every Latin American radical knew they'd get me in 10 years, and they did for the usual thing, which was elitism. <clears throat> the list of complaints, Tarkovsky films with foreign subtitles, and so on and so forth. Dario Fo in the original. Why didn't I do Dario Fo with the local pottery class? That's what politics becomes in England. And I'm sure you have the equivalent. Mm. Uh, and of course, there was nothing, nothing that reached the quality of seeing Dario Fo on stage. Yeah, before. It's, yeah, it's one of the greatest things I ever saw. I saw and then remember, of course, we even went through our little chapter where we couldn't come in, he couldn't come into America. So we were all there in the fight. And so you, and then you say, well, David Goddard, what's he doing? Why isn't he directing? What's he supposed to be? You say, well, sorry, I spent a month or two Part as part of in a humble way as part of the fight to get Dario into America, and we did it. But is but it, I'm making it sound like nobility. It's not nobility. Hmm. It's called practicality, and that's where the cantors of this were. The key thing that mattered with Tarkovsky through that whole period was how to get his son out of Russia because the son and grandmother had been kept behind as emotional blackmail over Tarkovsky leaving. And uh, so the most important thing I ever did was to run a committee for getting the sun out of Russia, which politicians held out on. And eventually Mitterrand did it. Mm. Not me, Mitterrand, yeah. of course. And, it, it, you know, it goes on like that, really, which is... They don't know, but this is this is how you have to you have to, and so for example, hold on, Tarkovsky's going broke. Claudio Bardo is saying to me, "We've got to get him some money." Right? I said, "What are you talking about?" This is Tarkovsky. Head of Channel Four turns up for one of his lectures. Jeremy, you do realize he's going under? Oh, bring him in on Monday morning. You get the money. It's not that it's easy. But you have to be prepared to say it and ask for it and do it. And we all know that the arts world is riddled with those people. Mm. So you, in you know, way you the, arts, the arts world is, is Phantom of the Opera is coming back to the West End of London with a West End, with a reduced orchestra, right? The great director of Phantom of the Opera, Hal Prince, to me is a man who used to meet me regularly because he loved... Le Cirque Imaginaire, and because he always wanted the right space 
for his Piscator principles to do Candide, where the audience can be in the center and the action happens all around the outside. Right, that's real fundamental need in a in a commercial world, if you like. Yeah. yeah. And so if you have, for whatever reason, if you get away with something which is probably even more difficult at the moment, which is making decisions as an old-fashioned artistic director rather than somebody who's got a, as in education now, go before the chief executive, um, then you nip it in. And if the audience comes and if a critic is there, and I'm educated on Edward Bond, on making history as he did, despite what a critic says. And Edward Bond, as you know very well, had to go to Germany before he came back as, as English history. In London, he, he was empty houses. And then Germany, Theater Heute, photogenic theater, and he's back, part of the syllabuses. And there he is living quietly. And everybody talks about the new Tom Stoppard biography. Nobody's talking about Edward Bond. So it goes, the battle goes on. Hmm. What did you learn from Brecht? What, how important was the Berliner Ensemble in your thinking? Fundamental. Um, it's like Beckett in that the royal court really aesthetically wouldn't have existed without them. And it's because they came to London in the 50s, not just because Kenneth Tynan did his number in, as a critic, but George Levine, Jocelyn Herbert, these key people, they went to see the work and they said, this is what we must do. And it gets very confusing in England because the English went puritanical over Brecht. They, they kind of said, oh, well, if we're doing Brecht, it's got to be miserable. We mustn't have any color. We mustn't have any real acting, because all the opposite of what the Berlin Ensemble was. Mm. Uh, but, but somehow this effect on the Royal Court directors, which was one of the beauty of minimal design, but not wasteful decoration, which is the key area. Again, so if the papers are now going to say, we've got to have our theatre again, we've got to have the English tourist industry, um, even though we hate foreigners, right? Um, uh, you know, there's a big problem here, which is that um, if you pile on decoration or whatever the word is, you can have your coach loads of Swedish tourists for Mamma Mia, but you won't have the quality of the work that makes the art form continue. Yeah, the quality of work you did. You went to Berlin, right? You went to the Soros and right. you, you went to the Berlin Ensemble. Yeah. I've lived yeah. Yeah. Because I'm a good boy, you see. I I got on with my friend Barbara Brecht. You know, Stefan and Barbara, they played a role, which is and partly they represent Brecht himself, which is it was a life of fucking sorry, forgive me. Mm. Um, of, of suffering. They lived a life of suffering. And I've been thinking of this model today over this kind of coming out of a door, going into a resting place, something opening up, something being more free. Brecht had to do it from country to country. You know, Barbara Brecht was a little girl growing up in Hollywood uh, not so long ago before she died. She wanted to see her house in Hollywood. So... <laughs> She left the chauffeur behind, went up the garden path, rang the doorbell, explained who she was and who her father had been, and was shown around the house. She was a little girl from Hollywood. And through it all, and through all the hell of Ulbricht and East Germany, somehow they made positive things happen. And we're still living with all of that. 
But as you also know, we're still living with a world where, for example, particularly, arguably in Japan, or at least Mishima thought so, we've still not really liberated the Japanese situation nor the German situation. Mm. And the, the, that kind of extraordinary life of, uh, which is, which is what, well, you know, we, we need, we need a Brecht, we need a Brecht. Mm. Germany had, I mean, and other, I mean, Germany had Brecht and, and, uh, and uh, Heine Mude. And, but the fact that Brecht went to school in provincial town with the genius of a designer, Kaspar Nehe, who was the real influence on British design, right, is just one of those miracles, really. Mm. But then, unwind, 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 whatever we're saying, how do you, you come back to Shakespeare or something? Mm. Which is, it's all, there, it's all there, it's all there, it's all there. It's all there, yeah, it's incredible. When Terry Yama came to you, uh, you know, you hosted so many also of the Japanese avant-garde. It's incredible. If you, um, what is your advice from your experience for young artists, young directors, young artistic, uh, uh, well, leaders, we're people all, who are taking over that. What would you say? Different. Listen, I want you to know this. This is what I learned. This is important. I, I'm partly doing the opposite for the first time in my life. I'm so depressed by the last year. Um, and but what I mean is, I have spent the whole of my life doing what a country mother told me, which is, you're not getting your bicycle because you passed the exam, you got to do it because you want to, and believe in it. And I have always told filmmakers or whatever you, whatever it is you believe in, you've got to go forward. Because of what it's been like in the last year or two, I now say to young people, don't worry that the, the drama schools are using you as fodder for making masses of money in a ghastly British way. Um, uh, just get yourself a bit of security so you can look after your family and feel secure so that you then can involve yourself in the arts and write as well, hopefully. But it's the first time I've acknowledged that, that if you don't give yourself, because I mean, because London is full of noble sons and daughters of Europeans who are working in Starbucks becoming managers and being sent to Korea to open Starbucks, but they're Hungarian or they're Italian. And they're in London, partly because probably they're in love with somebody in London, meaning another European. And there's, some, there's been something fascinating about the whole thing as ever with London, but it's not a romantic thing, but it has been about real suffering. And I think they've been very noble young people um, to somehow know that they can do it. You can do a job and write your film and somehow it'll all work out because of the way the world's got to come together. And, it, you know, I'm even like you, you know, I'm post-war. I have a different story to tell. The world kept getting better all the time. I was thinking today, I want hair to come back. I want everybody to take their clothes off. I want everybody to touch everybody else. That was hair, man. That was la mama. You know? And, uh, you know, as I'm in this very room, you know, the Nobel will have gone and there'll be a speechless young businessman in his early 30s who can't even talk because he's so depressed about what's going on, right? Meaning mental health we're going into everywhere. And until we're into to handling these problems, talking about it, you know, 
who gives a toss about Andrew Lloyd Webber? I mean, and what he represents, if you get me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but so that's what I believe in. I still believe in democratic intelligence in a slightly romantic way. But that's because I'm a bit huge Lawrence-like in that I'm from an area that's not meant to exist. His is, his is Nottinghamshire dialect. He wrote plays in Nottinghamshire dialect. Imagine being that stupid. And they're wonderful plays. But he doesn't, you know, and, and more and more, the reason why Scotland's got to separate is that our world does not believe in the smugness of Southern England. Very, you, very, what's happening here? Yeah. You, you monitor over decades, you know, you have monitored the British theatre, you know so many, I, I guess everybody, I've never seen anybody so connected in, in a theatre landscape than you when I was in London. So w what is wrong at the moment in London theatre and what could be done to make it different? But don't forget when you do that, I and mean, you've got the equivalent, I'm sure, when you do that, it's not because you make a theoretical decision. It's because that's all you can do. It's like mm -hmm. opening the door and there's somebody who's wounded. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first time I was in a room with Marina Abramovich in a, in a gallery, she made a mistake and her wrist started bleeding on broken glass. I thought, get me out of here. And instead, of course, there I was, by, not because I'm a noble person, but, but that's because what you have to do. Mm -hmm. you, you you do so you what do. does theater what does theater has to do now in your case in london the place you know what do you think is of urgency what is needed i whatever it is there's little sign of it at the moment um because it's to do with a key area of this pandemic for example whereby we all knew the future has pandemics. There's another headline in the evening paper I read today saying the next one's going to be worse. Okay, great. I think I'll go to bed. Right? In other words, that area that we who were educated in the 60s knew about, which is kind of intelligence and problems, which somehow because of the experience of the 20th century you can't turn into ideology right um uh but somehow whether it comes from the unemployed or the young or from minority groups or whatever it is it's somehow making problem solving coincide with the knowledge that we have and you can't do that so long as we have a folly over money. And so long as that understanding goes with historical understanding of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And like you, well, forgive me saying like you, mm -hmm. but the, uh, you know, one, one, one can but hope one's there tomorrow problem solving which is what but if somebody is i'm just saying i'm really saying don't i don't feel very romantic in one sense because i know that the noble friend who would say look work on this commercial script the reason why i don't do it is not because i'm a noble savage but because i can't i don't know how you do it whereas if you bring me Um, strange language from an individual who's emerged from a village or what have you. Literary manager at the Royal Court, Wally Simpson, N. F. Simpson, used to, used to permanently called me Polish. It meant that if he couldn't understand the script he'd been sent, he just should send to me because it's a Polish. You know, let's um, and then you realize it's just a privilege that you've hit against a cantor or a or a Beckett or what have you. But it's it's about problem solving. And I think 
Well, you're there, but I mean, it's also somehow radicalizing education again. Mm. Well, what do you think? Will writing be uh, a more important, less important? Uh, how, how significant? I've had a wonderful it? time with writing during the pandemic, but it was all virtual. I've got about six writers raring to go who I barely met, but boy, did we need each other on the phone and on the computer. That was my world out of this room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once in Denmark, once the editor of the Shooting Times, um, writing his first fiction, right? And the Iowa thing is a blessing, and I'm very lucky because I started with a year of special people, meaning Naomi Wallace, Rebecca Gilman, David Hancock, Todd Ristow at Hollins. And of course my role is I'm the Londoner which is, you know, if you can be in London, it is easier to get an agent or mm -hmm. what have you. Um, but I was lucky. I had a very bright year, at uh, my first year at Iowa. You know, um, no, so this is and as, as you know, the fact that two or three years ago, it meant that I had this very talented Iraqi veteran, you know, such that we, we did the, 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 the fed into veterans writers workshops and what have you, you know, the kind of the Iowa thing is gold dust. Mm. You know, what did the, you, yeah. What did you read? What did you read? What did you listen to uh, in this year? What inspired you or what helped you? This last year? Yeah. Besides your writing. Wordsworth for the first time. What? Wordsworth for the first oh, time. Oh, Wordsworth. Oh, wow. The, the prelude, which they say you can't read because it's so banal or whatever. And of course, he turns out to be like Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And the great thing, if you've got a certain background, is, is rediscovering your own culture, literature. Um, because I didn't come from bourgeois literature, really. Um, like I'm fascinated at the moment that the best writers coming from Iowa or related places seem to be um, transgender Eastern Europeans who've all been picking up boys in libraries in Bulgaria. I'm caricaturing, mm. you know, where people are coming from, or that, or that. Uh, Well, you see, Dickens, I, I discovered today he really did want to incarcerate his wife when she lost her looks. Incarceration, quarantine, go on and on and on. Mm. You know, the history of the theater is riddled with it. Mm. So you can, but what books did... Uh, uh, um, I've got them nearby, really. The person who I find most important, actually, who I can look you in the face over, is Daniel Kish. You know, the great Yugoslav novelist who is Jewish, Hungarian, Montenegrin, Serbian, and who lived just long enough not to be a nationalist and to warn against nationalism. And who happily had a friend in Susan Sontag who promoted publishing, yeah. his publishing. Daniel Kish, who is so difficult that I peep at him. I peep at him because he's so Borgesian and breaks all the rules and writes lists for three pages or something. Mm. 
yeah so so it was a time a time of rediscovery and collecting you know these idea of quarantine yeah, of uh, to theater our lives uh, politics the 20th century well after the, history, the last you know. the last line of shakespeare that i rediscovered this morning was i bring the brush that sweeps the dust from behind the door which is Puck, of course. Mm -hmm. So you can't have the fairyland. You can't have the magic of it all if you haven't got the broom. Mm -hmm. And that's my Gantel point, which is the, fuck, the, the work, the work. The work. And you have the Jacobian work. And this yeah. curious thing, which is rediscovery, which is discovering that Chekhov was Beketian. We must go on. We must go on, yeah. And that extraordinary way that Beckett, like Shakespeare, and Euripides have always been there. You know, that when I was directing Shakespeare very successfully in Kosovo and resurrecting the National Theatre, as we went from line to line with a great Albanian translator dead, who, who, long, who became a professor at Harvard, right, called Than Noli, right? Shakespeare was there, man. He'd seen massacres. You know, that his knowledge of what happened in Europe and is just a miracle. And it means that you can have the final wall. It means that not only are you excited yourself at what's in the language, but eventually you see there is an audience of ordinary people who got it. Like in Kosovo, as an ambassador put it to me, you could see that it was the means whereby a lot of people could mourn. This is something unique that theater can produce, can do. And, um, and as you said, you know, Shakespeare was there, Chekhov was there, Beckett was there. So um, there, is a, there is a line. David, uh, we are already much over time. Thank you for really sharing a, a moment in life, uh, sharing your, your thoughts, your brain. You have the highest respect from all of us of the, your life's work. What you did at the Riverside Studio is amazing. It is incredible, it's inspiring, and one could only hope that such a place, by coincidence, as you say, of an old film studio where someone is asked to do something, to bring something over from, you know, that worked here, and something grows out of it, it became so meaningful, and that this happens again now. And uh, as you said, it's a post war. You are the post war generation. We are, in a way, and we can only hope that those young kids you talk to teach to others, you know, will, will come, come out. It's a great privilege. Well, you'll, have have a wonder, you. you'll have a wonderful time with Emily. Yeah. So next week, yeah, to talk about next week, you know, Emily, man, she will be with us uh, next uh, Thursday. She has been for 30 years. She ran the MacArthur Theatre in Princeton, did so much significant work, also very well known for work on the documentary theatre. We will talk about also with Carl Martin. We will have Fergus Linehan from uh, Scotland, who runs the Edinburgh Theatre Festival. He will be talking to us what it means now where they are i mean they are planning to have it open but still nobody knows really what it was so we will get a real um uh, uh, update and then we will have uh, uh, as david would say the europeans who come to the capital joanna varsava from poland who lives in berlin this ogul Dormusoglu, and they created a work on the balconies uh, in prenzlauer Berg. artists uh, uh, who live there as a high concentration of artists opened their balconies, they created two editions of a festival that happened on balconies. People loved it. It was a great uh, contribution to that time of, uh, um, of Corona. So we will hear an update um, from them. Thanks to HowlRound um, for hosting us, VJ and, and, and Thea. This is wonderful. Andy for help to produce it and to our listeners. And uh, David, you know, it's a really, really um, a, a great, uh, a great uh, record what, you, what you're leaving in your influence. And we touched only the tip of the iceberg. It goes so much, so much deeper. So really, thank you. Congratulations on your work. And uh, it's, it's a hard time. It's a depressing time. But as you, as you point out, um, there is something in there that has always been with us and will come back. So uh, 
let's see how we get through it. And we hope that something will also grow out like a mushroom, as you said, you know, from in, in the landscape of London that will be inspiring. You feel it and you... bit by bit. You feel it bit by bit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, David, thank you. So great that it worked, that the Zoom worked out. And now you're back to your historic room and, uh, uh, and stay in contact uh, with us. So thank you. And thanks to all the everybody in there who helped you to connect to Zoom. There was an important talk and a, and a great record to have you with us. Thank you and bye-bye to everybody. I hope you will be with us next week and have a great Memorial Day weekend. Thank you.